Yes, hello everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to the Temporal Graph Reading Group today. And um, uh, we are very glad to have Michael uh, from Intel AI Labs to discuss his recent paper, um, Ultra Foundational Models for uh, Knowledge Graph Reasoning. So, uh, so as some um, quick words on Michael. Uh, so Michael Galkin is a research scientist at Intel AI Lab. Um, uh, in San Diego, uh, working on graph machine learning and geometric deep learning. Previously, he was a postdoc at, uh, um, at Mila uh, with Will Hamilton, uh, Rehani Rabani, and Jen Tang, uh, focusing on graph representation learning problems. And sometimes Mike writes long blog posts on medium about graph learning. So, so if you're familiar with Michael, you probably see a lot of his very nice blog posts, uh, which is uh, just always nice to read um, and look out for the beginning of year blog posts as well. Um, so yeah, so I'll hand the mic um, to you, Michael. Thank you, Andy. Uh, uh, glad to be back at Mila virtually, I'll say that. Uh, and uh, I'll try sharing the screen. And I also, yeah, that should work. And I also turn on the pointer. So yeah, now that should work. Perfect. Yeah, so uh, this work is uh, actually collab with the, still collab with Mila, with the, uh, some of, uh, with, with uh, Xin Yu Yuan and uh, Zhao Cheng and, uh, and Jian. And uh, yeah, it started in the, actually, I think the, the roots of it when I was still at Mila, but we finally finished it uh, this year. Yeah, so uh, uh, this work is about uh, reasoning on knowledge graphs one with one pre-trained model. So uh, you don't actually need uh, uh, to train graph-specific models anymore. So uh, a few uh, words of introduction is that we work with the uh, knowledge graphs. Those are multi-elaborational graphs and exist in many modalities, of many uh, under many sources. Uh, the uh, typical ones are encyclopedia graphs that are behind many search engines, like in uh, Google and, and Microsoft. Uh, Pretty much they're in the that is what is used in uh, LLM, say with retrieval of meta generation. There are graphs for sciences, for instance, UniProton, which uh, a lot of uh, protein transformer models are trained. This is in fact uh, is available as an alteration graph as well. And uh, there are other options for it, like spatial temporal ones. This is, for instance, the recently found one, uh, uh, Urban KG, Chicago and uh, New York, uh, and their uh, road networks as graph representation. Uh, so the basic modality we work on is those are just triples, <clears throat> called RDF in theory, but we are just interested in uh, uh, standard graph uh, formulation of this problem is that we have uh, directed graphs. So we have uh, directions of edges, we have edge types. Uh, often we're not given any input node features, so purely in the structural uh, reasoning domain. And uh, there are two setups, common literature, transductive and inductive. Transductive means that you have a, it for the same graph as you have trained on. Inductive means that it's, it's different. So either you add for instance, uh, more nodes, or uh, you have a completely different graph. So the, the basic task of reasoning here is um, call it knowledge graph completion or doing prediction. Although well, there are some subtle differences about it. Uh, so by the reasoning, we understand that given a starting node and a query relation, we want to uh, rank all possible entities as possible fields. So uh, we want to have a probability distribution at the at the end, or at least some scoring function that would rank the entities as potential tails. And uh, in inductive reasoning, we, we see that we might have, uh, uh, for instance, new nodes uh, at inference time uh, connected to the original graph, or we might have completely new graphs uh, with, that might might or might not share the set of relationships. Uh, um, so just to, uh, yeah. one, mm -hmm. one very quick question, and sorry to interrupt, like, do you prefer to of ask course. Yeah. Yeah. For so, sure. So just for the inductive reasoning, uh, just for reference and clarification. So uh, when you mean an inductive node, it means that it's not observed before, but mm -hmm. uh, you do have some information about the structure of this node, right? Well, when you the only, yeah, the only thing we have is uh, uh, its connection to other nodes. 
that might be uh, edge types or and its connectivity pattern. We don't have any node features here. Okay, but if you have a new node just with node feature, but you don't know any of connection to something else, like a new paper coming out, for example, will that also be considered? No, as... no, we, we need we need connectivity information. But for for this setup, if you don't have any edges, then you need features for sure. Okay, makes sense. Makes there sense. are some papers on that as well. Cool. So a brief history of uh, uh, graph representation learning approaches for multi-relation graphs that it started uh, almost more than 10 years ago already with the Rascal and Trans-Z. Those are uh, seminal models that are still actually interestingly strong baselines that if you tune them well, uh, those are all transductive models. So they will learn uh, huge entity and relation embedding, so be embedding tables. And so if you have uh, like 1 million entities, 100 million entities, they will learn embedding matrices with 1 million or 100 million rows. So that was the starting approach. And after that, uh, there has been a, a, an influx of those papers, more than 100 papers on different different aspects of uh, modeling, some uh, small improvement over transi over overdose. So yeah, there has been a flurry of those papers. Uh, most of them, though, are transducted. And they only focus on triples and the supervised learning approach. And the, the problem is that there has been no substantial progress for uh, since 2018, so for more than five more than five years. Uh, the most uh, up to date, say, uh, baseline was Rotate actually also kind of work from from Mila back in the, back in the days. And uh, uh, as you can see in the uh, in excerpt from papers with code after this paper was released, there has been pretty much uh, like a steady line. Uh, no much steady line, no, no big improvement over uh, previous models. So the performance is stale. And those are, this is pretty much the limit, the ceiling of transductive, of transductive models. Uh, however, with the appearance of geometric deep learning and graph neural nets, uh, the things uh, got much more interesting. And uh, we started treating the graph structure. Before, all those transactive models, they were trained only on a triple level. And they didn't really consider graph structure. They would learn it uh, somehow in a latent space. But uh, uh, it's it was not enough, essentially. We, we, we didn't expect uh, the model to fully understand the graph structure. Now we can, uh, we can do it with GNNs. And uh, pretty much a big breakthrough was in 2021, a few years ago, with the uh, neural Bellman for Nets. That's another work from me, like, you know, from Europe's 21. And uh, it combines a, neat, a few neat ideas. Apart from GNS, so it's also a labeling trick uh, work. It means that uh, explaining what it, what it, how, it, how does it work. So we, we have a query node uh, starting node. We have a query relation. We want to have a probability distribution over all other nodes. And uh, we initialize uh, this node with some vector, for instance, the relation type vector. And everything else, every other node is initialized with zeros. And then you know, run your message passing procedure. And uh, you have, in the end, relative entity representations. It means that uh, since this node was starting node, and then all other nodes, they they are vector, their final representation is relative to the starting node. Because if you had initialized a different starting node, then you would have different representation. Subject to isomorphisms in the graph, but uh, in big real world graphs, uh, they aren't that many isomorphisms. Yeah, so in the end, you would have uh, the probability distribution uh, relative to the head and relation. So that's, uh, uh, that's pretty powerful. And uh, uh, NBF nets do not need entity embeddings at all, so they are inductive by design. They only learn relation types uh, as uh, as those queries. So NBF net can transfer to graphs with uh, new entities, but uh, the set of relations has to be the same. Uh, yeah, perhaps this is the only formula <laughs> in the whole talk is that uh, mathematically it is written as we have certain indicator function. How we initialize entities. Uh, here we say that we initialize it with the query relation from the matrix that we learn, and then we just start a message passing procedure and have uh, node representations conditioned on the starting node. 
So after NVFNet, uh, the open question was, can we generalize the graphs with uh, completely new relation types? Because NVFNet still does those like layer by layer, uh, it needs a relation embeddings. So for instance, it can transfer between different uh, subgraphs of Wikidata or different subgraphs of Freebase that share the same relation type, but it cannot really transfer between Wikidata and Freebase or uh, completely unseen uh, graphs. So that's the main question that we undertook in this uh, new work. Is it generally possible to generalize to both new nodes and new relation types? And uh, this pretty much leads to uh, the design of foundation models because you really have very different structures. Say in the Freebase, in, the, in its biggest versions, you would have about 90 million nodes and 1,500 relations. And in Wikidata, you would have 100 million nodes with 6,000 6, relations. There are very different graph structures, very different relation types. If if you are to learn shallow embeddings, like those trans-V or Rascal and one of those 100 shallow embedding uh, approaches, then uh, you would probably learn those enormously huge uh, embedding matrices, like 100 million rows by certain embedding dimensions. So they would take a lot of memory just to store them even though there is no real gnn processing on top of them as well you just need uh, maybe 50 <laughs> uh, gb of ram just to store those uh, so yeah that, that, and they are not transferable so you you spend all those resources on training one graph uh, and uh, you will have to retrain it again on a different graph and uh, that's why the area has been pretty much still for many years, because you have to spend a lot of compute just to train the model on the on the specific group. And we want uh, finally to bring <laughs> the bird-like era to uh, graph representation learning here, and uh, to have a, an approach that we can, where we can pre-train a, a model on one or several graphs and transfer zero shelter with fine tuning, but transfer out of the box to any unseen graph. And uh, the main problem there, what is, what can be transferred? Because we don't have any node features, the relation types are different. Uh, language models learn at least some sort of vocabulary of tokens, of language tokens. And uh, they can break down any problem on any language, well, subject to supported uh, uh, tokens. But still, uh, they can break down any any task formulated expressed as natural language to the input. What kind of uh, such invariant vocabulary can be designed for graphs that even have different relational vocabulary? So that's uh, that was a, a, an interesting research question. What is the transfer environments here? And uh, we had to look back uh, on the at NBFNet uh, to answer this. So uh, NBFNet. Uh, as we have seen, it, they learn relative entity representations thanks to the labeling trick. Uh, so by initializing the starting node, so here we have a query, say, about Michael Jackson. Uh, if we initialize this node with, with some vector and everything else is zero, then uh, after the message passing, all other entities would have some uh, some representations, but relative to the original node. So if we put Michael Jackson here in the very corner, the center of the coordinates, then everything else would have certain relation uh, to or certain distance to the starting node. And uh, yeah, it transfers uh, out of the box uh, to other graphs that share the same relation type. And uh, that's why we can have the such inductive reasoning by the means of relative entity representations. The idea of ALTRA, which stands for Unified Learnable and Transferable Representations, is that we can build relative relation representations. And uh, so go one level up from entity representations. I'm going to break down all this, uh, all this images step by step. So the idea is that we can try to use relational interactions as invariants. Uh, and uh, those relational interactions are cap captured by building a graph of relations. So how relations interact between each other in a graph. And uh, uh, there are se several fundamental interactions. We call them fundamental, but uh, just those that are uh, lie out there low hanging, as low hanging fruit. Perhaps there, there can be more, but uh, uh, that's a subject for future work. So generally, yeah, the graph of relations 
uh, captures how relations interact with each other. So for instance, if we have this subgraph with Michael Jackson, Thriller, and Quincy Johnson, and uh, Michael Jackson has two different outgoing relation types, like author and for that, then those relations interact, interact with a with some edge types had to call what we call head to head. It means that uh, there are two edges that share the same head node with those with those two relation terms. The same uh, if, uh, for instance, you have a certain path. Michael Jackson also thriller and thriller has a general disco. Then the tail of any edge of any author edge is actually a head node of another of some edge with the relation genre. So we might have the relation tail to head. It means that any any tail of relation author it can be a head of uh, any edge with the uh, with the type genre. And uh, if we have, for instance, thriller and Quincy Jones or uh, in genre disco, then uh, uh, the tail to tail relation would be uh, a self loop. It means that there are some nodes. There are some edges with a type genre who have the same uh, the same tail node, and that would be the in our case it will be a self loop. So if we combine that together, uh, we have a graph of relations. And so we have the number of unique nodes is equivalent to number of unique edge types. So this is a, still orders of magnitude smaller than original entity graphs. Even with those uh, huge Wikidata or few days you will have at most a few thousand nodes, so which is peanuts, or uh, for even for GNNs. And uh, the fundamental alteration here is that those uh, graph of, graphs of relations do not change because those uh, interactions, uh, tail to head, head to tail, is a topological interactions in certain sense. So they're pretty much independent of uh, relation entities. So those can be used as a uh, transferable invariants because whatever graph of relations you have uh, you can build such a relation graph pretty efficiently actually with just a uh, few sparse matrix multiplications in fact uh, building each of those edge types is equivalent to exactly one matrix multiplication so it's still efficient and linear time and the number of edges that you have and uh, if we try to learn some representations on top of this graph of relation that can actually transfer between different graphs and uh, it transfers Remarkably well, as we will see. So yeah, the idea is that let's try build the graph of relations and uh, capture those four fundamental interactions. And now if we initialize uh, query relation, say in our case, it might be genre, then if we put it to the center of our coordinate system and everything else, every other nodes author and for lab will be zeros, but then we start this message passing procedure similar to if that but on the graph of relations, then uh, we'll obtain representations for all relations conditioned on this one. And uh, we can still learn uh, embeddings for those uh, four fundamental interactions because they actually do not change over graphs there. They remain the same because they uh, uh, they just capture certain topological interactions in any graph. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll be using that to infer relative relation representation. So now we, if, we, if we have a completely different graph with different nodes and different relation types, we can build the same uh, kind of a relation graph and uh, apply our learned uh, learn model with a tail to head you know, tail to tail embeddings and the GNN weights to obtain relation representations for this graph with like completely unseen relations so uh, and we'll yeah uh, mm -hmm. just a quick uh, just a quick interruption so this kind of give me the similar vibe as what we do for like homogeneous graph, the kind of like graph motifs, right? It's essentially the same idea. So it's graph agnostic. So it doesn't rely on specific, what well, are the edges, like what does it mean? But it just kind of general like motifs on top of the graph structure. Uh, sort of. Uh, in motifs, it, you would represent a graph as a bag of motifs, where right. they're just a certain indicators where uh, which motifs you can find in certain graph and uh, create a sort of, some sort of a fingerprint, which is like a higher order. You can think of it as a higher order representation. Uh, yeah, that is some sort of transferable invariance. Although mm -hmm. motif mining is uh, slow and uh, it exponentially explodes uh, with the size of graph and uh, with, the, with the size of, of the motif. So here we are in a more efficient realm of linear algorithms. I see a question in the chat. Yes. Uh, would this be transductive in terms of relations? Uh, 
no, because uh, we can here we transfer to uh, graphs with completely different set of relations. The only thing that we'll, we learn as a embedding table, those are representations of those higher order uh, fundamental relation interactions. They do not change. So from that perspective, uh, we can learn their embeddings. But uh, from other all other uh, points of view about entities or relations, this is purely inductive inference. Cool. Yeah. Uh, so how does it work? Uh, uh, a few steps. So given the original graph and given a query, so in our case, let's say Michael Jackson genre, and we want to have a probability distribution over all nodes. Uh, this the, this algorithm is applied to literally any multi-relation graph. You don't need any uh, node net features. Uh, we first build a graph of relations. Uh, it's, it's step one, so we can do it efficiently with sparse conjugation multiplication. So it's not really an overhead anyhow uh, to the model. Uh, we have four fundamental interactions. We initialize the query relation genre in the, because we know it from the query. So in this uh, graph of relations, we initialize the genre node with uh, with some starting vector. And we found that the, the most efficient way to do it is just initialize it with a uh, vector of all ones. So we, your starting set of features for this graph would be that the query node has a vector of all ones, all others have zeros. And then you start message passing. Uh, we tried the learnable vector for uh, for this, and it didn't actually transfer between different graphs of, of different sizes. So uh, initialization with one is uh, surprisingly efficient. Uh, so, and uh, yeah, with step two, you just run message passing uh, and BFNet like architecture on the this graph of relations. And in the end, you have conditional relation representations. It means that if you initialize the genre and run message passing, you will have relation types, the whole matrix of relation embeddings, so relation representations, I would rather say. Uh, conditioned on genre. Like if you have uh, initialized the node, say the author node, then the output features, node features of the graph will be different. And that's pretty powerful. It means that uh, your relation representations really depend on uh, the type of the query you have. And uh, it brings a lot more expressiveness to the model. Uh, yeah, and the, the third step, uh, once we have uh, build conditional relation representations conditioned on the genre query. We just feed it to any inductive link predictor, say vanilla and BFNet. And uh, then we can initialize the Michael Jackson node with some query and just run the standard and uh, another entity level GNN for link prediction. So once we have yeah, uh, the each relation, uh, once we have the relation embeddings, representations conditioned on the query node, um, we use them in any. Uh, inductive GNN. So that's uh, pretty straightforward. So the, the only uh, need to adapt a little how we uh, build, uh, how we transform relation features for each layer of a GNN, but that's just a few uh, MLPs. So it's, uh, again, it's not really what we are doing most of the framework um, tools. Uh, so in, in the end, we don't need any in input features, no nodes and edge features. So the only thing we we'll learn is the embeddings of four fundamental relations and GNN weights. Even the uh, query the query vector here is just vector for one, so it's, we don't learn uh, this vector. This algorithm generalizes to a graph of any size and relational vocabulary. So whatever in any graph where you have more than two edge types, uh, it will work. And uh, it allows for zero shift inference and fine tuning on any graph. So because if we learn, uh, if you train a model to capture those interactions, uh, you can just uh, apply it out of the box to any graph and uh, you, you can expect to see some uh, non-trivial results. And uh, indeed we see so quite some non-trivial results in that in actually we see uh, state of the earth results. Uh, here that the average column is perhaps the, the most important. So what happens if we pre-train the model uh, on three standard graphs in the literature. So those are WordNet, Freebase, and Codex, so they're encyclopedia style graphs of uh, the medium size. I would even say maybe small, smaller, uh, small, medium size up to uh, 40,000 nodes, but uh, usually it's like 10 to uh, 20K. So those are, okay, medium, medium size encyclopedia graphs. And we evaluated on 
all other existing graphs in the literature. So pretty much all of them, we ran out of graphs in the literature. So if you have more, if you know more, just let us know. We run more evaluations right now. Here, it's uh, in, in this table, we have 40 because we, there are published results on those 40. And then we evaluated on 17 graphs, 17 more graphs. Overall, we are uh, uh, we evaluated on about 57, 58 different graphs. And uh, yeah, I'm generally <laughs> running out of uh, benchmarks for that. The thing is, uh, if we apply the model in a zero shot way to all those graphs, we see that they, uh, it works much better than supervised baselines, trained specifically on each of those graphs end to end. Being a transductive or maybe some inductive models, uh, we see that a, a one single pre trained model uh, out of the box with zero shot inference works better than all those supervised baselines. So, on average, uh, average across all those graphs, zero shot performance is already better than uh, supervised models that you train and spend all the compute resources per specific graph. Fine tuning can uh, bump the results even higher, especially on the graphs with the uh, some distributional shift uh, because those are uh, say still medium medium graphs but uh, in the graphs where we observe bigger gaps those are much larger graphs which have uh, either uh, hundreds of thousands of nodes or maybe thousands of relations so we, uh, the model needs to adapt a little but there's a question well we'll see how it can be mitigated so yeah the the thing is that one single model generalizes uh, in a zero shot way to graphs from different very different domains not just from the pre-training domain, but also to uh, which will be like Wikidata Freebase and whatever, but also generalizes to ML, which is another uh, family of data sets and uh, to completely uh, new graphs like HitchuNet is a biomedical graph, DBPD and Yago are big uh, graphs uh, in the community as well. I see another question in the chat. What are the limitations in terms of number of relations? Does the performance depend on the similarity of the main one features versus the main two features. Uh, there are no limitations on the number of relations. Uh, the pre-training the pre data sets we have, uh, they have, uh, say, one data set has 11 uh, relation types, another one has 237 relation types. And all those uh, all those graphs, all of them have very different number of relation types. So uh, absolutely no assumptions on, uh, on relation types. And uh, we just uh, we need a connected graph so we can build uh, uh, a connected graph of relations. Uh, yes, those are results for uh, for link prediction, where, where we build probability distribution and rank against all uh, entities in a graph. Um, uh, just what one is, other, yeah, yeah. Sorry, just one other question. Is there anything specific for the word net that they're sort of better than? The ultra network? The is sparse graph. So uh, WordNet is actually not really a graph, it's a tree. So uh, the average degree of WordNet is two. And uh, uh, there, there are two most, most popular relations and all others are very sparse. So it's indeed a more of a tree and uh, you'd expect hyperbolic models to work much better simply because it's not really a graph. A yeah. But since the data sets are in community, we still had to evaluate on that. Uh, otherwise, we'll just the, the same. The, the, there is a problem with null graphs as well because uh, they uh, have some problems with sparsity as well. So uh, uh, I would maybe uh, consider only half of those uh, uh, data sets. I would say maybe seventy percent as real graphs that would de uh, deem okay for to for evaluation. But uh, those are pretty much standard now tasks, standard benchmarks in the literature. So uh, do graph attributes like density and sparsity have impact on inference results? Uh, yes, but not but indirectly. So uh, that's exactly the reason why we observe some performance gap in, uh, say, sparser graphs, so WordNet and ConceptNet as well as sparser results. And there is certain distributional shift as well, uh, because if you train on medium-sized graph and you want to transfer to uh, graphs of hundreds and hundreds of thousands of nodes, millions of nodes, millions of edges, then we might see uh, some problems with zero shot. But uh, once we do the fine tuning, then we efficiently bridge uh, this distributional shift. Uh, what's interesting is that the single pre-trained model generalizes to graphs of different sizes already, uh, up to a certain limit, of course, but still it, it works surprisingly well on graphs 
uh, of from 1,000 of nodes to a graph where we have 120,000 nodes and a million million of edges. So usually GNNs have do have problems with generalization to uh, uh, you know uh, to graphs of it will be much larger than the training the training ones. And uh, here we uh, we see the problem is alleviated a little. So uh, again, the training graphs have at most 200k edges and uh, 40k nodes. And we generalize and really show some pretty good results after fine tuning. It's even better on the graphs with millions of edges. So that's uh, pretty interesting. And we'd like to explore some theoretical foundations. What uh, what gives us this uh, this nice feature? Yeah. So uh, in number wise, if we look at the average performance uh, across all those graphs, then we see that zero shot. One single one single model in zero shot inference already outperforms all the supervised models by a good gap uh, by five absolute points and more points, mean reciprocal rank points in terms of heat set n. And if you add uh, data set specific fine tuning, then it incre increases the performance by further ten percent. And the fine tuning is actually pretty sample efficient, so you don't need to show a lot of like to train it long. You, you, we found that just two or 4,000 steps, fine tuning steps is enough. So depending on the graph size and your batch size, it might be say one epoch or even smaller. For graphs of millions of edges, this will be just less than one epoch. So you just show a few thousand edges and uh, and, and the performance saturates. And uh, another cool fact is that it generalizes to unseen domains. Uh, so uh, a, a graph, yeah, a model pre-trained on encyclopedia knowledge generalizes to biology, uh, to the biology domain, which is his unit graph, and uh, out of the box we have performance comparable to trained state of the art. After fine tuning, we have it much better. So from zero point twenty five up to zero point forty, pretty much, and it's just far, far exceeding all existing state of the art. And uh, it generalizes to uh, Concept net, which is common sense reasoning, although it's a little weird graph because it's very sparse. And uh, zero shot performance suffers from those distributional differences, but after fine tuning, it's pretty close to models that uh, would use even some features. And uh, we also generalize to the geographical uh, and spatial temporal graphs. So we're not using it in temporal features here, they are in another in task for this data set. But uh, again, out of the box, zero shot performance is better than uh, those supervised trained baselines. And after fine tuning, it's much, much better. Uh, yeah, it, let us know more domain specific KGs because we actually ran out of uh, graphs for evaluation. Another question that you would ask from a foundation model is uh, Is there any benefit of training, of pre training the model versus training the model from scratch? So, what if you just train your transformer? On each of those data sets uh, that you evaluate, but uh, do you really need pre-training? So the the answer here is uh, uh, pre-training uh, helps, and pre-training uh, makes sense because uh, we see that the average performance of a, of a zero shot model is pretty is is very similar to training each model from scratch. So here uh, we we trained on each of those uh, fifty something graphs. Uh, several models, several different random seats, uh, and uh, each of those uh, Y bars is a model uh, trained from scratch on each of those graphs, and, and we compare it with our one single pre-trained model. And uh, yeah, the, the fine-tuned, the, the pre-trained model already somewhere on par, and fine-tuned fine model is better than all those models trained end to end. So the message is you save a lot of compute by using a pre-trained checkpoint. So uh, you don't really need to train the model on each of those graphs now, because uh, why would you if you have a, a similar performance? Uh, it's still a question, though, of uh, uh, bringing more domain transfer uh, from those pre-trained graphs. So, uh, can you can we even bump the performance more for uh, uh, from a model pre-trained on several graphs? Um, uh, yeah, uh, um, a very kind of naive question. So you were talking about the domain specific uh, data sets and so on. So mm -hmm. why don't you also train with those domain specific data sets? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Absolutely. That's uh, actually what uh, we are doing in the background now. Uh, we do it for, uh, originally we didn't do it for uh, purity of, evalu of evaluation. So mm -hmm. we, we know that we are not training on those models. So we're evaluating uh, right. the transfer right away. Uh, otherwise, for you will be evaluating, if you include those graphs in the into the data set, you won't be able to measure zero shift inference performance anymore. Yeah. Uh, but now it is uh, as in language models. You cannot, yeah. you do not know on which, <laughs> if you feed in certain data set, whether it's uh, in IID or OOD. Because who knows on which uh, on which data it was trained? So even uh, test set contamination is a problem for them. Uh, so yeah, in our case, we just uh, took three standard benchmarking data sets for pre training, and everything else will be zero shot. But of course, uh, we can just uh, merge all those data sets uh, all together and uh, train a single model on, on on all of them at the same time. That's uh, uh, that's a very natural way, I would say. So just we need a uh, training for longer. That is what we are doing, and we'll probably deliver more pre train checkpoints in the future. Right. Uh, a few oblations. So, uh, in the beginning, I spent some time explaining conditional representations and why they are important. Uh, and uh, they do bring quite some improvement uh, compared to other in and other ways of obtaining relational features. So if we drop edge types, so if we do not capture uh, relational interactions, then we already observe quite some big performance drop. And if we are not using uh, conditional GNNs on top of graph of relations, then the performance just drops uh, 50%. So those are really crucial components for, uh, for the model. And uh, uh, we have some ideas that those conditional relational representations have something to do with the higher order logic or the second order logic but we don't really have any theoretical proof so far uh, but it's again super interesting to investigate uh, why the gap is so large and uh, another uh, question from the church of scaling those is uh, uh, what's happening if we add more data uh, and more compute uh, does the performance in increase if we have more graphs in the pre training mix? And uh, the question, uh, the answer is that uh, uh, the performance increases, but, uh, but uh, soon it reaches uh, saturation. So uh, we trained several checkpoints, uh, several models uh, trained on uh, several mixtures from one to eight graphs, and we measured the zero shot inference performance on uh, many data sets. So th that's the purple line is what we're in interested in. And uh, we see that after training on four or five graphs, we reached a uh, saturation point. And uh, the message is adding more graphs to the pre-training mix helps, but up to a certain extent. And uh, how do we make the model learn better from more diverse graphs? This is, uh, uh, this is an open question, which we still want to investigate further. I see a question in the chat. Uh, uh, what would a good MRR be? Is 0 0.3 good to be useful in real life tasks? What value, what value are they using in search engine ranking studies? That's a good question. So uh, uh, all those numbers, say from, from this original uh, table, some number, the quality metrics are often independent from the graph size. Uh, and it's, uh, it goes hand by hand with the uh, uh, graph topology. So for instance, uh, high results on WordNet, uh, high MRRs on, the, on this graph, uh, doesn't mean that those graphs are uh, smaller, are smaller or larger than any others. In, in fact, they are at about, uh, those are very sparse graphs. Uh, but say, for instance, those uh, those freebase graphs, they are uh, those two of about, about this of a similar size, but the performance gap, the performance difference between them might be also quite significant. So, good MRR is a function of uh, graph size and graph density. Uh, there are many works how to um, how to treat MRR and the, whether we estimate properly. Uh, 
it has also been found that MRR is highly susceptible to uh, links that you do not have labeled in a test set. And uh, in fact, this performance, that those numbers can underestimate the real MRR because uh, in many of the, in many of those data sets, test sets and validation sets do not, do not list all missing edges. They in fact other missing edges, but they are not labeled anyhow, but the model predicts them. But since the test and validation set do not have those as true edges, they will be treated as a negative uh, samples, uh, as uh, false predictions by evaluation, but in fact, they are true. And uh, this is still an ongoing problem with an evaluation. Uh, so yeah, they're generally, uh, you have to know your graph to know that 0 0.3 is a good or bad. So for instance, for uh, Freebase, uh, the pre-training pre graph, the state-of-the-art number is 41 MRR. But now for, for WordNet, state-of-the-art is 55-something. Uh, and uh, the lit in, in the literature, I somehow remember there was this uh, in the head by, by seeing so many papers. Uh, but indeed, this is not the metric. Mm, doesn't really transfer uh, in a sense that you can have the same value of the metric for the, each different graphs. And it will be, it will denote something the same. So the uh, MRR 0 .0 0 0.4 is good on Freebase, but it will be pretty bad on, uh, on WordNet. Is there a metric that will be, that will give you spit out a single number, so, I know, 0 0.75? And will be transferable across all different graphs. That's actually a still open research question. Uh, yeah, that that was the the last slide. Uh, that uh, adding more data helps up to a certain point. Uh, scaling in, in in terms of model size still an open question because our our model is now pretty small, up just one hundred seventy k parameters, so like peanuts compared to transformers, and. Uh, we haven't found that bumping the model dimension helps very much. So uh, right now it's uh, it has a hidden dimension of 64. If you bump it to, to 128, you will see pretty much similar performance. And this is a question uh, as well for future work that why uh, it doesn't benefit as well from scaling. Well, shall we scale together data size and the model size? Uh, so the all interesting questions. And it, it opens up a lot of uh, avenues for future work, what you can do with, with that. So for, for now, we we validated on the link prediction, on inductive link prediction. But there, are, there is a good bunch of other tasks up to say, even complex query answering, which is the next complexity step beyond link prediction. There are more uh, questions about theoretical understanding and scaling those, what we can do with those foundation models. And uh, all of those are uh, quite open now. Uh, yeah, open challenges would be to uh, derive scaling laws, uh, scaling in terms of size, model, size in terms of data size. Uh, how do we investigate theoretical properties? We're well, somewhere in the area of second order logic, but we don't really have uh, more clues about it. Uh, we want to evaluate the model on more complex tasks. And actually, uh, uh, we have some first results in that area, and we see that actually it does transfer out of the box to a more complex logical answering uh, tasks. And uh, the question more about engineering and how to scale to really large graphs of billions of nodes. But this is a question of adding, of swapping the entity level GNN with something more scalable, like a star net or something uh, more, even more memory efficient. Yeah, so uh, uh, the last slide is saying that inviting you to check out the rep. Uh, the, the checkpoints are there. It's, all the checkpoints are pretty small, just two megabytes, because uh, the model is. Uh, 177,000 parameters. Again, nothing compared to transformers. You can run it in the browser. Uh, I should I should actually update the slides with the code and data because the repo is already uh, is already published uh, with the uh, with the code and data, and uh, the paper is on our is on archive. So yeah, uh, if you have any more questions, just shoot me an email or open an issue in the repo. Everything is is there now. Um, I shared the link to the repo in the Slack. Oh, mm -hmm. so sorry, in the, uh, yeah, uh, in the Zoom yeah, chat. Also share in mm -hmm. the, the Slack for, mm -hmm. for anyone to see. 
And, and thanks so much for the great talk, Michael. It's been a been very interesting talk. Uh, I'm impressed by how parameter efficient the learning is for for this, right? So, so with small model sizes, which is much smaller than what people use for like uh, like for the molecules and so on, right? And uh, and the performance is very strong. Um, so you mentioned like a few steps, including joint training on different domains and so on. So mm -hmm. what are you currently planning to work on, like in terms of how to improve the model and so on? Um, yeah, we have uh, now uh, a few uh, uh, processes running, trying to pre-train the model on all the graphs that we have in the mixture and mm -hmm. see uh, uh, and see how whether it works better. So the, the, generally, it bridges the gap on those uh, bigger graphs. So if you add uh, Yago concept net and those data sets to the pre-training mixture, then those gaps disappear pretty fast. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the average performance grows even faster. But, but then the, uh, the question is how to convince the community that evaluation is... Uh, makes sense, yeah. Yeah, makes sense because uh, this is not a zero-shot inference anymore. If you add uh, all the, if you train on all graphs simultaneously, then it's evaluation of the, uh, how you how you can leverage all this multi-domain knowledge in uh, in the link prediction task. Mm -hmm. uh, or yeah, we, we, another problem is that we, if you fine tune the model on those graphs in the pre-training domain, in the pre-training mixture, then it it doesn't really grow further. So that's why there is still a gap uh, between uh, uh, between state of the art models on those on those graphs and right. uh, uh, and and training. So if if you if we fine tune the model, say on WordNet or on FreeBase, just on a single data set, then we don't re really see much of performance improvement. So that is still an open question. Uh, yeah, it, it becomes uh, yeah. So generally, engineering wise, we can do a lot of things. Uh -huh. and there's the question of uh, uh, saying that to the community, like, look, those results actually make sense. You should start using that model more often. Yeah, you don't need to train a graph-specific model anymore. Uh, uh -huh. But yeah, folks will start asking questions like, ah, it's not zero-shot inference anymore. It's, it's uh, some uh, weird uh, shot uh, inference now. And uh, right, yeah, we, we just need to do some, we need some compelling evidence that it, right. that it, it makes sense. Yeah. And uh, I still have a few questions, but is there any like question from the audience first? So feel free to type your question in the chat as well. Um, so so I guess I will ask first. So um, so we see here on the pre-training data set. So mm -hmm. it's not so as you just mentioned, it's not getting the state of the art on two of the three for yep. the pre-training data sets. And then I uh, and then I guess you briefly talk about it a little bit, but. Uh, but you don't think that's a problem that can be solved by just throwing more parameter at it? Just increase the model capacity, or do you think that's something maybe can be improved in terms of the architecture, or uh, like at least on the pre-training data sets, um, right? Mm -hmm. What do you think can bridge those uh, gaps in terms of performance? Yeah, it, it's always double-edged sword in that sense. So. It... There should be a way to scale up both model size and the data size. Mm -hmm. We just need to uncover why, what, what are the bottlenecks, perhaps maybe some normalization layers we have to dig into. And uh, another way is to do some architectural changes. For instance, introduce more relational interactions. So far, we're only capturing those four basic ones. Perhaps right. there are uh, there are other features worth capturing, which will also be transferring. And uh, with them, maybe the performance would uh, would be increased as well. We just need uh, something as transferable as those four. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Uh, yeah. So I have one more question, but uh, but yeah. So how do you see this can be extended to temporal graph domain? So I guess mm -hmm. we're at the reading group. So I'll ask the relevant question here. Yeah. So, uh, generally, it, it's pretty flexible and extendable to. Uh, uh, to other domains because it gives you just structural features. If you have any temporal features, textual features, uh, numerical features, you can do a, you can add them at a fine tuning step. So uh, mm -hmm. uh, this model will give you after doing like uh, model dot forward, it would give you features, uh, structural features for relation types and for nodes uh, if you want. Uh, 
uh, you are then free to add anything else. Do concatenation with all those features with uh, your node features that you have, or uh, or maybe concat the different uh, re well representations from different time steps of the same graph. That 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 should still be possible. And uh, yeah, since this the set of even if the set of relations is different for for those temporal graphs, it can right. still work. The, the only thing is that the, those graphs have to be multi-relational, so it, it doesn't work for homogeneous graphs yet. Right. Right. I see. Nice. Thanks. Um, so, so if there uh, like there are no more questions from the audience, then we can uh, uh, then we can close up the talk today. So let's thank Michael again for the very interesting talk today. Um, and uh, yeah, I will see you all um, next week as well for the reading group. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.